How did I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his death has paid my ransom. I hope you know that love of the Lord this morning. If Jesus is precious to you, that means he's touched you with his love. And that's why we're here. We've been talking about a bride fit for the king, the church, according to the New Testament, is the bride of Christ and our hope that brightens our days and lightens our steps is the wedding supper of the Lamb. Uh, I hope that's your joy. So uh, we've gone through several passages on this topic. We talked about our earthly bodies being tabernacles of the Holy Spirit, carried along in us wherever we go, uh, carrying the furniture of the tabernacle for spreading the aroma of Christ everywhere. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We talked about growing up into Jesus by speaking the truth in love. That's the spark plug. Remember Ephesians 4, 15, and 16? Speaking the truth in love, we grow up into him who is the head. That's how the church grows. Then we talked about Jesus building his bride. On this rock, I will build my church from Matthew 16. And the rock is the confession of Christ by believing hearts and mouths. If you believe in your heart, and confess him with your mouth, you will be saved. Uh, today, I'd like us to move uh, toward the spiritual house. We've already read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, but specifically focusing in on verses 4 and 5. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. This is where I've taken my thoughts from as a text, and I'd like you to keep your Bible open so that you can look at that context, because you know that a text without a context is a pretext. If you, you know that, right? Text without context is pretext. Keep telling yourself that as you uh, listen to people preach. As you come to him, says Peter, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I think a very close parallel to this from Paul is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. If you were in Sunday school, you heard Rick read this and uh, expound on it a little more. Uh, this will be a supporting passage. So Ephesians 2, 19 to 22 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, as I uh, thought about this and, and poured over it this week, I uh, was also going home to a, a house that's being renovated. So sweeping dust from cement and bricks. And I, it was just obvious to me that in our congregation, we have an Olympic bricklayer. Glenn Charlton won a prize in Ireland as the best apprentice bricklayer in the country when he was only 19. Did you know that? This is a world-class mason. And so I thought, well, why not have Glenn come and show us what it means to build up stones to be a house? The guy can start from the ground and finish with the roof and you have a functioning house. And here he is, in the flesh. Uh, you should have seen the Uber driver that brought Glenn and, Glenn and me to Calvary this morning when he saw bricks and building stuff, and, and we told him we were going to church. Uh, he thought it was a very strange church. But Glenn, come and tell us a little bit about joining stones together. Okay, a slight correction. I didn't make it to the Olympics. I was the best in Northern Ireland. Then I competed in the UK, and I only came fourth in the UK, so I didn't actually get to the Olympics. Uh, but the Lord. <laughs> Amen. No such thing as coincidence, right? You're not here because it's a coincidence. You're here because God has brought you here, okay? 
Nothing happens out of coincidence. And it's the same in construction. In construction, nothing should happen out of coincidence. You know, they have pinch. No. Everything in construction has a reason and it has a measurement. Okay, so things that we do in construction have reasons. When we start on a construction job, the engineer, the architect, the designer, he will give us a starting point, a starting position, a place that we need to start from. It might be measurements on the plans. Sometimes you'll have a site surveyor come with an apparatus bigger than this one. It's called a theodolite. And it is linked to GPS. And with that, they can give you the exact position that's on the plants with the coordinates. They will give you the exact position where you need to start from. That's how we start in construction. So at that point, I don't have a theodolite. I don't know how to use a theodolite. I use a measuring tape, and it works just the same. <laughs> uh, so we start. You might not all see this. So I have the, the, the a cornerstone down here. I will start on the cornerstone. We will put a peg in the ground. We will dig foundations. Uh, we set a block. We, we, we use blocks. In this case, concrete blocks, which becomes our cornerstone, our, our starting point. So from there, uh, I will set up this apparatus. This is called a dumpy level. Uh, it's quite old, but it works pretty good. So I plumb, I've got my plumb line down here, and I put that right in the position, the exact position of the corner, right on the corner of the cornerstone, and I get my alignment from one side. I move this around to the right degrees that I need, and then I can turn it 90 degrees so I have a square corner. You know in your house, when your tiles are thin at one side and they come out and get wider at another side because it's not square? Because maybe they didn't do this process. So we got to take our square from that corner, that cornerstone, that cornerstone that has been set. From that cornerstone, we also take our measurements. So from one wall to the next wall, I will measure where I'm going to put the next corner. From that cornerstone, I'm going to go and measure, put the next corner in. So measurements are taken from that point of reference, that chief cornerstone, if you want to call it. From there, I will also take my alignment from that corner. I start building the corners, and I will take the alignment. This is a corner block. It holds the line, and I can put that on. Every brick that I set is going to follow this line. Uh, from that corner point, we will also plumb. Now, this is a plumb line. I don't use this anymore. I have a, a plumb rule or what we call a spirit level, which is a bit more accurate and a bit faster to use, but this gives you the idea, plumb, straight up and down. Okay, so we will use that as well. I will also use this. This is my gauge. It has the measurements on it. So I can keep each row, each row of bricks will have the same measurement coming up the gauge rod. This little thing on here belongs to this apparatus here. I can't switch it on in here because it comes out of a beam, a red laser beam comes out of it, uh, so it wouldn't be good for us. It is received by the receptor here. I can go 150 meters in any direction of it, and it maintains things level. So when I get to the job, first day, second day, third day on the job, I will set this machine up. This will go on top. And I set the receptor to the height on top of this block. I'll set this up, get it adjusted. And from there, that point, I will always go from the same starting point, the same corner all the time. From there, I can level all the rest of the building uh, from that chief corner. OK. So from there. Get the corner set. We are measuring from that corner. We're leveling from that corner. We're plumbing from that corner. We're gauging from that corner. Everything from that corner. Uh, we start building our walls after that. 
once we've got that corner set up. Now, bricks. In this case, we're using bricks. In those days, they would have used stones. When we build bricks, there's lots of different bonds that we can use, lots of different ways we can build the bricks so that they end up being stronger. This is a bond. So looking at this, do you think this is a strong bond? No. Not really, no. <laughs> Definitely not. All right, at least we got that right. <laughs> okay, so they'll move individually, the whole thing. Even if I put mortar between the joints and set them all with mortar, this will eventually crack here. Doesn't matter, because it's not bonded together. Okay? So what do we do? We've got English bond. I'm going to show you stretcher bond. Thomas wanted to do this with mortar and everything, but I think it would have taken too long. So we'll just do a dry stretcher bond. So we've got our half bricks coming in. We joint in between. Normally the mortar my grandfather always used to joke around and says the mortar keeps the blocks apart. It doesn't keep them together, it keeps them apart. Well, when it's dry and hard, it keeps them together. So that is our wall, and it's a little bit stronger. If we put the mortar in and everything hardens, it all becomes one. One piece, one wall, and it's all stuck together and it's strong and it can withstand a bigger load and it helps in your construction, okay? But in Bible times, they would have used stone. I'm not a stone mason. In my country, stone masonry, that's another trade altogether. That's even more difficult. But the stones that they would use, that the, the, the professional builders would use to build a wall, you know, they're all different sizes. They come different shapes, different sizes. Some of them need to be broken. Some of them need to have things chipped off. We have tools to do that too. You know, you can have your electrical diamond tipped tools right here. This is my favorite right here. <laughs> it's like Thor's hammer. Or you can do it with a trowel as well, you know. We can break them up. It's not that difficult to break the bricks. Thomas saw this this morning, but that's a broken brick now. Well, I can change the bond as well. And we can have a bond like this with these bricks coming in here. It's a Flemish bond. This is a stretcher bond. You have English bond. You have all these different types of bonds, you know, and we can use these different pieces of bricks in different ways. Uh, but every individual stone or brick will follow the alignment, will follow the level, will follow the plumb, will follow the gauge from that initial cornerstone. Doesn't matter what it is. And they will all become part of one huge wall that can withstand a lot of battering <laughs> and protect and create you know, the buildings that you see today. So, so Glenn doesn't only work with physical bricks, he works with living stones. Tell us just a little bit how you use your gift and ability of masonry to rescue living stones, Glenn. We work with alcoholics, drug addicts, street men, so they come off the streets, they come to us. We obviously preach the gospel to them so they hear God's word. It's the word of God that transforms their lives. When they're done in rehab, they come and work with me in construction. Uh, and, uh, it's a good tool. You, you know, you go to construction, the first day you don't see that much happen. After a week, after a month, you see the progress that you can make and the purpose that you can have in life, you know, even constructing, building, mm. things like that. And it helps these men have some purpose in life. 
as so well. So Glenn's uh, program is one of the missions that Calvary uh, is involved with. And we, as our family, have benefited from that. Uh, one of his guys has been building at our house. And in fact, he was so good that he found a better paying job. <laughs> and he went and, went and got paid more. Thank you, Glenn. God bless you and your mm -hmm. ministry. And So just as a review, what is this? And what's it a metaphor for? Jesus is our cornerstone. Everything is measured off the cornerstone. Didn't you love the way he said nothing happens by chance? The exact position of the cornerstone is planned by the architect. What's the position of Jesus? Paul says, at exactly the fullness of time, in exactly the right place, by the right virgin's womb, Christ was born on the foundation of the prophets, the Old Testament, the story of Israel, the Passover, the law, all of that formed an underground foundation. And then Jesus is born and begins the above ground building of his house. And each person who is touched by him, becomes a living stone. So my question to you this morning is, are you a dead stone or are you a living stone? Is your life aligned with the corner or is it just aligned with itself? And how do you know? And what should you do? What's missing in Glenn's demonstration? No, the cornerstone's there. It just wasn't, didn't fit on the table. The mortar, the cement, right? We actually joked around about how messy that would get if he was slapping cement on here. Spiritually, what would that be a mortar, or a mortar, a, a metaphor for? The mortar metaphor. What's the mortar metaphor? Bond, right? Glenn used that word over and over. Connection between the members of Christ's body is how we're building up. We're not a pile of rocks. We're not individualists coming to church to get what we need to do our thing. We are one building. And as a local church, I would say we are one section of that building connected with all the other sections through time, through space, all around the world. This morning, the body of Christ is gathering in different ways, in different places, worshiping the same God through the same gospel by the same spirit and the same word. So what I want to challenge you with is, are you, first, are you a dead stone? And if you're a living stone, are you an individualist? Are you disconnected? Are you built in to the body? Are you, do you have cement with other members of that body for commitment, loving service, and spiritual sacrifice? That's what Peter says the house is for. There's two things I think we need to do. Number one, as we come to him. We need to ask a question because the first word in chapter 2 of 1 Peter is therefore. And whenever you see a therefore, you should ask, what is, it there what is it there for? Right, very good. So if you go back to chapter 1, 1 Peter, chapter 1, I hope you have your Bible open because you can keep me honest. Uh, verses 23 and 20 to 25, we'll just read 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. This is a message to the born again. This is a message to those who have been touched by Christ's grace and love and have been reborn. It's for people who have two birthdays. You may not know what your second birth date is, but you've been reborn of the spirit, as we've discussed here, of the second Adam. Not just the first Adam. We're all born of Adam and Eve, but some of us are born also of the spirit into the, the father's family as sons. So that's what the therefore is there for. Now, it says, 
as, uh, wait, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Every single one of those five things that we're supposed to get rid of is anti-love, right? Malice, badness toward each other, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander are all anti-bond, anti-love against the others. And guess what? They're all for the born again. They're all in the church. They're all in me. And I need to constantly rid myself of those things. So last night I went out and found these bricks in the construction that Glenn's doing. And all of them came out of a wall that his guys tore down. So this brick has been in my house for a while. But it's going to be repositioned, and it's hard to find matching bricks like the old ones. So we've been knocking concrete off of the old bricks. That was such a great metaphor for me. So I'm here knocking old cement off, and I'm thinking getting rid of the hardness, getting rid of the places that don't fit with other people, getting rid of my envy and my hypocrisy and my deceit that I have in me so that I can be built with you. Connect. Love, serve, sacrifice my own desires and will for the sake of the building up of the body. So I said there were two things, and that's really part of the first. The two things are come to Jesus, because Peter says, as you come to him, the living stone. Come to him in salvation, first of all. If you have never surrendered, if you've never fallen at Jesus' feet and say, said, I have pretended to be my own God. I have taken what is yours for myself. I give it back to you. I give you my life. I sacrifice all of my plans and desires, and I want your life now. Repent. Receive his salvation. That's the first coming. I hope you can do that this morning, and we'll have a time at the end where I'll help you, uh, lead you in that, and we'll also have a prayer time outside the door. But there is other comings. Peter says he was rejected by men and precious to God and those who have come to him. Rejected. Paul even says he's crucified outside the camp. He says Moses set up the, the tent of meeting outside the camp. Come to him outside of the camp. What does that mean? It takes effort. It takes getting out of your routine to come to Christ. You don't get a lot of immediate return. It means not doing something else, like sleeping, so that you can get up and commune with God in the morning. It means coming and spending your Sunday morning with us instead of going somewhere else more fun. Coming to Jesus means coming to the one that the world rejects, but that God sees as precious. And the more you come, the more you will see him as precious too. Come. To the Lord. Verse 3 says, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Taste the Lord. Feed on him in your hearts, the word says, that bread of the presence in your tabernacle. His presence in your life, in your soul, in your very body is the goodness of God in his grace. Crave spiritual milk, verse 3 says. That's the milk of the word. I've had such a privilege among you to be given half a day at least a week to just soak in a passage of scripture, to dive deep, to beat on it, to suck on it, to drink from the precious sweetness of the word of God. It is precious. It is sweet. If you're just reading it like you read the newspaper, I challenge you to get below the surface. Study, memorize, meditate day and night, dive deeper, and you will drink the spiritual milk of the word. That's what it means to come to Christ. Come to him through his word. Feed on his word. It will increase your faith. Thirdly, trust in him. Verse 6. Verse 6 talks about those who stumble because they disobey the message. May we be those who trust and obey. And we obey because we trust him. There's a second thing we need to do. We come to him, but then at the end, Peter tells us the purpose of this spiritual house, and he kind of shifts from being a house to being a household, which is the word that Paul uses in Ephesians 2. 
Verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What does a priest do? A priest takes the needs of the people to God and brings the truth and commands and ordinances of God to the people. Now, Peter's a Jew, right? And he's, he's, his ministry was primarily to Israel. He knows what people think of a priesthood. And he's declaring through this to all believers that we have become a royal priesthood. The people of God wandering through the world to do the works of God. To bear spiritual sacrifices in this house that's being built up out of those who have been redeemed, who have come to him and become living stones, are being joined together in love. And now we are those who are, bringing, who are offering spiritual sacrifices among each other. This list could go on and on. But I want to challenge you with three specific spiritual sacrifices this morning. Romans 12, 1 and 2 Paul commands us, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I want to submit to you that the first sacrifice in this spiritual house is your own body and its desires that you put on the altar and say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. I want such and such, but I know that's not according to your word or your will, and so I sacrifice that to you, not to gain salvation, not to gain your love, because I've received salvation and your love. I live the way you want me to live, and I will not do what I want, because I know your spirit desires to do something else. Galatians 5.17, the spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, therefore we do not do what we want. See, the world will tell you, whatever you want is who you are. That's your identity. Do whatever you want. You have freedom to do whatever you desire. But we as the spiritual house make that a spiritual sacrifice. The second spiritual sacrifice is a, spiritual, is a sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. There is power in an attitude of constant praise. It changes your perspective to begin your day with thanksgiving and praise because Jesus has done it. He's already finished his work and we owe him our thanks, our praise, our lives, everything we are because he's created us and he's purchased us. Living with that attitude the psalmist talks about a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Those who offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, I will show them the way of salvation. That's Psalm 50. Are you a person of praise? Have you decided beforehand this week that you will live in an atmosphere of praise no matter what happens because you believe that God is sovereign? Everything that happens, he is using for your good and for his glory. And the household of God offers praise as a constant sacrifice. The third spiritual sacrifice is love. 1 John 4.12, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. That's an amazing statement. God's love made complete? How could the perfect one be made more complete? It's because his glory is expanding through the likes of us as we learn to love like he loves us with his spirit in us. Romans 5, 5 says, hope does not disappoint because he has poured out his love into our hearts through the spirit that he has given us. We are not a pile of rocks. If you are a member of Christ, you love his bride, you love his body in ways that make you sacrifice, in ways that make you give up your money for things that you would like to do with it and give it to schools like the one in Mato Grosso that we prayed for this morning. Because you love the work 
of God, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ that he has died to save and died to sanctify. Love is our spiritual sacrifice. Learning to say, like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. In your marriage, wouldn't your marriage be different if you said all the time, not my will, your will? Wouldn't your friendship be different if you said, you know, I don't really like to do that, but I love you, and I'm going to do it because you like to do it. Now, obviously not going against the word in that, but joining your life with others. We talked about membership, church membership in our Sunday school class this morning. I wish it had been as full as this is. Because church membership means saying, not my will, but thine be done. I will submit to the leaders of the body that God has put me in. Like Glenn told us, nothing happens by chance. Jesus was born at the right time, and so were you. You are here because he has you here for his purpose. And if the leaders of this particular wall in the body of Christ is saying, we would like everyone who's committed to Christ and to this body to be a member, you submit. You say, okay, I'm not sure that's so important, but I'm submitted to Christ and to this body, and I will be a member because of love for him and love for each other. People will know that we are his disciples, not by our dress, not by our nice language, not even by our doctrine, by the love that we have one for, the, one for another. Have you come to him? I hope so. I hope you're coming every day. I hope you're coming more and more often. I hope your coming is part of what you're doing here this morning and that you're learning to offer the spiritual sacrifice of your body and its desires sacrifices of praise, and extraordinary love for each other. Several years ago, I got to go to the Taj Mahal with our mission leaders. We were having our international council meetings in India, and we had the privilege of spending a whole day touring the Taj Mahal in India. If you've never been, it's far greater than the pictures can possibly tell you. It is truly a wonder of the world. The man who had it made using hundreds of his slaves uh, certainly loved the, the, the wife that he buried there. Uh, they say that almost the entire script of the Quran is inlaid in stone on the walls of that building somewhere. Hundreds of thousands of tiny pieces of stone carved exactly the right size to fit next to the others and create this beautiful spectacle of actually a mausoleum for his dead wife. Um, so it's not the purpose that I want you to see. It's that construction that I and you are being fit together to form a spiritual house in the world and into eternity. Did you know there's no temple in heaven? Revelation says there was no temple in the New Jerusalem. God himself and the Lamb, his body, were the dwelling place, are the eternal dwelling place. And guess what? When Jesus says in John 14, I am going to prepare a place for you, that's the place he was talking about. And he's doing it right now in us as we chip off a rough edge and we say, oh, that hurts a little, but I'm a, I love this person and I'm going to serve them. I'm going to give to them. I, I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to give my money because I believe that God is building us up as a spiritual house as we come to him. Let's pray together as we finish. Just close your eyes right there where you are. I'm concerned that some of us may still be dead stones. Maybe you've never come in saving faith and repentance and said, Lord, I believe your suffering, suffering paid my ransom. By your stripes I am healed. Nothing you can do pays for your sin. No work you can perform will take away your guilt. But your guilt fell on him if you put your faith in him. And you can do that right where you are. Just surrender. That's all it is. I believe. 
I surrender. I am not God. Take control of my heart and my body and my life. I repent of my sin. I believe in you and I trust you for my eternal life. And you will become a living stone. Ezekiel says he'll take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And you'll be, become part of his body. You can do that right now. Now, if you do, if you have, tell someone. I'd be, I'd be overjoyed if you'd tell me. I'm going to be standing right out here on the patio in a few minutes praying for whoever wants to receive prayer. And I'd just love to pray over you and seal that decision this morning. But some, most of you are already living stones. Maybe you come to Calvary wanting a fix, wanting a fill-up, wanting to get your tank filled, wanting some teaching, but not really wanting to get too involved, not really wanting to connect. You don't have time for more friendship. Uh, there are problems with getting connected with people, and you're right. But you need to come to him by coming to the church. And I'm not talking about coming on Sunday morning. I'm talking about coming with your life to connect to other lives, to pour out that love in your heart on other people and connect with them in a way that says, I'm here for you. I want to serve you, not my will, but yours be done. Would you make that commitment? If it's not here, do it somewhere. Do it in the body of Christ. Because if you love Jesus, you will love his body. Father, we come. You are here. We surrender. We come to you, the living stone rejected by the world, but precious because we know a little bit of your preciousness. Thank you for making us alive when we were dead in our sins. Thank you for pouring out your love in our hearts. Teach us to love even our enemies in your name as you did. Fill Calvary with supernatural, unconditional love for one another by your spirit that lives in us so that the world will know we are your disciples and that you would build us up and complete, perfect your love in us, abiding in us as your house. We ask you to do this for your glory and for the fullness of our joy in you. In the name of Jesus, amen.